This morning, Republicans racking up big wins in the final weeks of the legislature. But what is not getting done? We have questions for Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Is it time for Texas to look at replacing the property tax? A Republican state representative explains why that is not as radical as it sounds. Texas Democrats did not make the runoff for Congressional District 6. They are shut out of big decisions in Austin. Is this a low point for Democrats in the state? We'll ask Matt Engel, a veteran consultant on the left. Austin, now 48 hours away from reinstating its ban on public camping. And Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo got a big boost last week, but she told us she is not running for governor. So will incumbent Greg Abbott really face a serious challenger next year? Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. Let's begin this Sunday with the top political headlines here in Texas. When Texans were freezing and in the dark back in February, guess who was making money? Billions of dollars of it. Natural gas companies. More than half of the state's power plants run on natural gas. So when the power went out in February, the price of gas shot up and those gas companies were able to sell their product at record prices back to electric companies. They were trying to get our power restored. This is an issue the legislature is looking at right now. The streets of Austin will soon look different again. The ban there on public camping will be reinstated on Tuesday. Last weekend, Austin voters approved it. This will move the homeless encampments off the streets and off of public property, but it still does not solve the homeless problem, one that every big city in Texas is facing. And Texas Republicans want to restrict how teachers talk about race and racism. A bill in the Texas Senate would bar schools from requiring that teachers talk about current events. It would also prohibit teachers from discussing certain viewpoints. Supporters say this bill will strip politics from public education, but critics call it a whitewash of American history. 22 days left now in the legislative session, and Texas Republicans are racking up big legislative wins. These are conservative bills that have not passed before. Constitutional carry, the heartbeat bill, but what about energy reform after that deadly storm in February? We have questions for the number two leader in the state, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. He spoke to us. Governor, thanks for the time. Let's start with all the headlines that have been coming out of Austin over the last few days. Early Friday morning, the House finally went into recess after passing that pared down version of the changes to state election law. It, it, this pared down version of the House doesn't have everything that the Senate version had. I'm curious, is there anything that's non-negotiable when this comes back to the Senate? That happens between the House and Senate on major bills. You know, each House has their own view. At the end of the day, Jason, we will pass one of the strongest voter integrity bills in the country. Uh, the, the preliminary look that I've had, I think the changes are, are, uh, are something we'll work with them on. So we will have a strong bill that will do the basic things that the people of Texas expect. In fact, there was a, a poll released, you may be aware of, uh, Jason, that um, says that 85% of Texans, that's Republicans, Democrats, and independents, 85% of Texans support photo voter ID at the polls. 85% support verifying mail-in signatures on ballots. Uh, and so those two key issues, and there are many more in Senate Bill 7 that will be in the bill, uh, I think send a strong message of what Texans uh, support. Uh, they also support that we have uniform laws on elections in the state. And last election, Harris County went their own way, while the other 253 states followed the law. Harris County didn't. So that's a lot of the uh, issues that we address. Let me tell you something else very quickly, Jason, which you've not heard on any show unless I've been saying it, because no one else will write it in the paper. No one else will talk about it. But the question was asked, do you consider it easy to vote in Texas? 95 percent of Texans said they feel it's easy to vote in Texas. Think of that, Jason. And, you know, an American Airlines came out and criticized our bill before they read right. it. I don't think 95 percent of their flyers think American Airlines is easy to fly or the best airline. I mean, 95 percent think it's easy uh, to vote. And well, quick two other stats, Jason, since we passed photo ID in 2011, which people said, oh, that's voter suppression, our turnout has increased from 58% of registered voters to 68% of registered voters. And the increase in the gubernatorial elections, you know, the off-year elections when the governor and I run, right. have increased 76% since 2011. 
and our presidential elections have increased 40 percent. And in the top 10 states populated in the country, Jason, Texas has increased voting by over 40 percent more than any other state. So this nonsense that this is voter suppression is the same nonsense we heard in 2011. And we are outpacing every other state in voter turnout. And again, we've increased our, our registered voting turnout from 58 to 68 percent, one of the highest in the country. Let's talk about constitutional carry for yes. a moment here, too. Early on, you suggested there, there were not enough votes to get it passed. Right. There weren't. And then there haven't been for, for multiple sessions. Now, what changed? Uh, what changed is that I think the House passed a good bill and I think we made it stronger that, that brought in support. For example, uh, over 100 uh, sheriffs uh, support the bill. Many in other uh, areas of law enforcement support the bill uh, because we did a couple of things. Today, it's unlawful. If you're a felon, a convicted felon, to carry a weapon, uh, a police arrest them, and very often the DAs or the courts let them out with nothing more than a six-month sentence. Now, in our bill, if you're a felon and you're caught with a weapon illegally that you should not be carrying, you will face a minimum five years in prison, no probation. That's a strong law that law enforcement says will get guns and criminals and gang members off the street. The second thing we did is we said there are four categories of the law that we don't think you should be able to carry if you're convicted. If you've committed a terroristic threat with a weapon, deadly conduct with a weapon, assault causing bodily injury with a weapon, or deadly conduct with a weapon, those four categories um, are in the House bill that you could carry. They're not in the Senate bill. And that's the main difference in the bill. But we think the House passed a good bill. We think we made it stronger. Quickly, I want to ask you about energy reform as well, too. Yes. Natural gas companies are reporting over the last few weeks, they've made billions of yes. dollars in profits from that February winter storm. Uh, now, it seems that many of those same companies, in the lobby at least, are against plans to weatherize and are against plans to, to require these natural gas producers to register as critical infrastructure in case the power goes out again. Are, are you going to hold natural gas companies accountable like you have the electric power generation side? Yeah. Well, in Senate Bill 3 that we passed, and it's in the House right now, and I believe that bill will come out, we address the, the gas side of it. Uh, so yes, we will. Jason, look, I'm not going to leave Austin, whether it's this session, a special session, or when we come back to do redistricting, without passing laws that prevent this from happening to the, the highest level that we can of our ability. Uh, you know, Mother Nature can be brutal at times, but we can never have another storm like this impact Texas like that storm did. And so there has to be accountability on both the electrical and the gas side. Finally, we're hearing a lot of chatter about a potential special session, not for redistricting, but for energy reform. Do you think this is going to go to a special session? At the end of the day, the governor calls those. Um, I know this, that I don't want to leave Austin uh, until we have this issue addressed totally. Uh, more power in the future. Yeah bring down the $9,000 cost, address those overcharges in the last 32 hours, replace the board. We have replaced two members of the PUC already, uh, and uh, we passed a bill to increase it from three to five to give the governor more appointments. I want some business leaders in there who are clear thinkers. They, they just didn't have the right, the right people weren't running the show uh, in the most critical time. Governor, thank you for the time. Yes, sir. Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo, she got a high profile boost a few days ago. The national group called Emily's List that works to elect Democratic women. It gave Judge Hidalgo a big award as a rising star. If she is a rising star, like so many call her, and she likely is, what will she do next? Will she seek higher office? Well, remember, Judge Hidalgo told us here on this very program just a few weeks back that she is not interested in running for governor, at least next year. So if she is not, which Democrat might jump into that race? Lots of people across the country are watching this, including Abby Livingston, the Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief for the Texas Tribune. Good morning to you, Abby. Good morning. Democrats don't seem to have an obvious high profile candidate for governor next year. What are they going to do? Well, that is extraordinary because although to the regular viewer, it may seem like uh, it's still very early in the election cycle, it's actually getting kind of late, um, at least candidates tend to be very clear uh, there. It's pretty easy to tell who's going to run and who won't um, even before they announce. You know, we're still kind of waiting on Congressman Beto, former Congressman, um, where he comes down. 
But this is such a strong indicator of where Democrats see, at least in Texas, this cycle going. If you'll recall two years ago, they were lining up to run for Senate against John Cornyn based on uh, the, the good feelings of their successes in 2018. Right. And so recruitment is the very first sign that people like me look for in which way the winds are blowing. And we're just not seeing uh, folks rally to the to the seat. Indeed not. Quickly want to ask you about the big news there in D.C., and, and that is the uh, the vote on uh, Lynn Cheney potentially to strip her from her leadership position in the GOP. Uh, they're obviously upset about uh, how she voted uh, on Donald Trump and what she said about Donald Trump. The vote is secret, but have you heard how Texas Republicans might vote? Have they been outspoken at all? It's been somewhat quiet. The one who's been most interesting to watch is Congressman Lance Gooden, who uh, is based in Terrell. Uh, about a week ago, he came out with a tweet predicting she would be out of leadership by the end of the month, and that was on May 1st. Mm. And so just to have that sort of startled everyone, people who may not have even known who Lance Gooden was from other states. And so, but I do think there's probably going to be some private support for Liz Cheney, um, but it's, it's, it's becoming a harder uh, thing for pol politicians, Republicans to defend her, but there, there is still an affinity for the Cheney family, I think, within the Texas delegation. Gotcha. Abby, back to you in a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, property taxes in Texas among the highest in the country. Is it time for Texas to look at replacing the property tax? A Republican state rep explains why that is not as radical as it sounds. And are Democrats at a low point here in the state? We'll ask Matt Angle, a veteran consultant on the left, what they should be doing watching Inside Texas Politics. Let's talk property taxes for a moment this Sunday morning. They go up every year, sometimes by double digits. The question is, is it time for Texas to finally reconsider them? State Representative James White says that is an easy answer. The answer is yes, but how would he do it? The Republican from East Texas laid out his idea in the latest episode of Yolitics, and here's part of our conversation from the podcast. House Bill 3770, it's a recognition that we need to do something different. Um, you know, we don't use our property like we probably used it 150 years ago when we were going growing corn or cotton. We're not really making any revenue um, uh, income from our property, so to speak. And, and the way that we are funding our local governments um, and, um, you know, we have this very awkward state property tax code. We need a 21st century system. And I think a, a flat consumption tax um, that's fair to everyone, that's transparent, that not only supplies the revenue for um, our local school districts and their maintenance and operation. Actually, the bill didn't intend to really deal with other local entities other than schools, okay? Mm. But uh, deal with the maintenance and operation while at the same time uh, eliminating, um, you know, several dozens of, of taxes and fees, most notably the franchise tax. Uh, I thought Republicans were still for getting rid of that. Uh, I, I'm a Republican and I'm for getting rid of it. So it, it's a thought of having a simpler, flatter, more transparent tax code. You know, for a skeptic out there who would say, there's no way you'll be able to eliminate property taxes in Texas, though, they'd be wrong, wouldn't they? I mean, hasn't this no, happened they, before? They would, they, they would be wrong. Uh, Texas has a history of eliminating property taxes. At one time, we had a state property tax, and it took us a while. There was a constitutional amendment, amendment that, that, that set a date certain in 10 years, and we figured it out. OK, so uh, we have a history of getting rid of the state property tax. I mean, get getting rid of a property tax assessment. So I know the state can do this. And look, we're still here. Uh, some say bigger and better, but we can be even bigger. So it is getting a lot of attention right now. You can grab it if your phone is handy. Just turn on the camera, aim it at the QR code on the screen here. It will open a window and take you directly to our conversation there with Representative White. And remember, new episodes drop every Tuesday. Now to a question that many are asking here in Texas. Are Democrats in this state at a low point? They barely missed the runoff in Congressional District 6 in North Texas last weekend. There's no clear high profile candidate for governor next year. So what happened to all the momentum that Democrats had? 
questions we posed to Matt Engel, a Democratic consultant who runs the Lone Star Project. Matt, it's good to see you again. Uh, let's start with what's happening in Austin in the final weeks of the legislature down there. The GOP seems to be just racking up wins with the uh, heartbeat bill, the constitutional carry, the changes to voting laws. And, and again, Democrats are just shut out of this because of sheer numbers. Well, they're outnumbered, that's for sure. But I wouldn't call these wins for the Texas uh, public. It's uh, really defeats for the Texas public. The only people winning here are the most extreme elements of the Republican Party. These are QAnon victories. And the, uh, uh, the uh, irony is that all of those Republicans ran for re-election saying they were going to focus on lower taxes and on health care and on uh, taking care of our schools. They haven't dealt with any of that. All they've been doing is uh, trying to attack people's voting rights and attack people's personal liberties. It seems in the past few months that, that you know, with Congressional District 6 race in North Texas, uh, with these huge legislative wins down in Austin, that Democrats have had setbacks. Would you describe it like that? Well, n certainly not CD6. CD6 favored Republicans from day one to day last. That's a district that was carefully gerrymandered to elect Republicans. And there's a hard ceiling for Democrats somewhere around 45, 46 percent. Uh, the interesting thing to me about CD6 is that uh, Susan Wright didn't get to 20 percent, didn't get one out of five votes, uh, and that the, the anti-Trump Republican there, who in past years would have been a fine candidate, a uh, combat veteran, a small businessman, he didn't get three percent. And so what CD6 shows that the, is that Donald Trump owns the Republican Party. If there's a deed someplace, his name's on it. Do you think Democrats will run a, a serious candidate for governor or um, in 2024? I expect that we will. Uh, I think that it's still a little bit early while the legislature is going on. Also, the uncertainty of redistricting uh, makes it unclear as to uh, what type of districts that certain legislators and certain members of Congress are going to have. And so I think that once the legislature ends and once we get a sense of redistricting, I think you'll see some pretty strong candidates look at statewide office. What do you think about Matthew McConaughey? Uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. I don't know him. Uh, you know, I think that... Uh, uh, his performing well in polls is more a reflection of people being dissatisfied with uh, Greg Abbott. I mean, Greg Abbott has proven to be a weak and an ineffective and incompetent governor. Uh, I mean, here's a guy who said the, uh, the power grid wasn't going to fail. Two days later, it failed miserably. Uh, turns out that his guy was in the office uh, when the prices spiked, uh, and he didn't tell the truth about that. And so I think Abbott's vulnerable. I think the, uh, that uh, uh, people are able to convey on Matthew McConaughey everything that they want that Abbott is not. Matt, good to see you again. Thanks for the time. Good to see you. So that is one take from the left. But next on the roundtable, we'll ask political journalists, is the Texas Democratic Party weaker than ever? And is there any bright spot for Democrats this legislative session? Inside Texas politics back in just a moment. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Abby Livingston is back with us from the Texas Tribune in D.C. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram each week. And, of course, Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA in Dallas, joins us as well. Abby, let's start with you and, you know, what's happening with, with Republicans, not just in Texas, but in D.C. as well. Not a single Republican, not a single Democrat, rather, made the, uh, the runoff for Congressional District 6 last weekend. It seems like Republicans are really building momentum heading into uh, the midterms next year. Well, this is a Republican seat. National Democrats really distanced themselves in the aftermath of that election and pointed out that they did not invest heavily in this race. But I think that what it should be worrisome is compared to 2018, um, there just doesn't seem to be the organic energy on the ground that existed for Democrats, even in the state of Texas. So I think that's the first warning sign, but it is awfully early in the election cycle. That's a good point, too. She makes, Bud, about the, the or organic, you know, uh, rising up from the, from the bottom here, too. We, we haven't seen that so far. Yeah, the, you know, the message wasn't there that Democrats tried to run a 2020 campaign in 2021 on, on health care and, and on COVID, which people weren't really uh, thinking about by May 2nd. So, you know, it, it really wasn't there for the Democrats. Republicans got organized. They're, they're mad that they lost the presidential election. You know, they, they are turned out in high numbers. They found these new issues to bring back suburban women, like the campaign against critical race theory. They rolled everything that was multiculturalism or diversity into that label and uh, turned out a lot more votes. Uh, the Republicans are gaining strength. They are gaining strength, Bernadine. Does, does that surprise you at all that, that here they are, you know, obviously, you know, two Republicans making the runoff in CD6, but they're having huge legislative wins in Austin as well, too. They are really getting ready for next year. 
Well, they're getting ready, but uh, as Abby said earlier, it is really, really early in this uh, election process. Uh, keep in mind, once you get closer to the elections and they have their candidates, and you're also looking at redistricting, but uh, you don't see the excitement now because of this, but they do need to start looking at who they will run on statewide levels. They're running these elections as well as the congressional seats. But I think it's really early to say that they don't have momentum because the, uh, the Republicans have it. They're, they're intra-party uh, politics at this point. They're fighting. So uh, they have to get out there. The Democrats are, are, are together in terms of party. Well, let's talk about the Democrats for a moment here, uh, Abby. If, if the Republicans are doing so well, is this the weakest the Democratic Party has been in years in this state? I wouldn't say it's the weakest. They've had some much rougher years, I feel like, maybe 2014 and that, that sort of time. But it, the, the Democrats are still in a regrouping phase after a disappointing in 2020, which was basically a status quo election, but they spent so much money, so much energy for almost no gains around the state. And Bud, looking legislatively in, in Austin, is there any bright spot in Austin for Democrats this session? The only bright spot for Democrats is that corporate America is starting to take the Democrat side and corporations in Texas are trying to help the Democrats uh, stall some of the Republican legislation. Uh, not every bill, that wasn't true on abortion, or mostly on guns, but on voting on uh, the election law, yeah. uh, the election bill, there, there was some corporate help. Uh, the only thing that's helping the Democrats right now is, is corporate America, but is the Democrats aren't able to muster much strength on their own. All right, bud, thanks a lot. We're back again next Sunday. Hope you can join us there. Have a good weekend.